This Sunday, um, I'm sure you've all noticed, is the first Sunday in Lent, um, which is the time, well, the season, the Anglican season, during when we remember Jesus in the desert for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Um, and we will make reference to that. The, obviously, the Bible readings reflect that, and we will make reference to that during the service. I think that, you know, it's, it's particular this year, isn't it? This, this locked down time is in a way like a desert for us. And as Jesus had much more time um, when he was in the desert with nothing to do, really, um, there are similarities with some of our circumstances that we have more time than we'd normally have. So I hope that, you know, you may have pause for reflection this morning and um, find some ways in which to use that time that stretches ahead of us for six weeks um, to draw closer to God. The order this morning, the, the liturgy, um, the order of events, if you like, um, is slightly different from usual. I've deliberately rejigged it um, for reasons which I hope will become clear. It gives you an opportunity to respond to what I'm going to say in a minute. Um, and the real focus is going to be on God's love for us and how to use Lent to um, focus on that and to respond to it. Now, I don't know whether there are any notices. Um, I haven't got any, um, but um, I, I don't know whether anybody else has got notices for this coming week or indeed for next Sunday. You'll need to unmute yourself if, if you do. No, okay, that's so, fine. Peter, there are opportunities during Lent to key into various groups and discipleship resources and so on. Um, people should have received an email if they didn't get in touch with me and I'll um, send something out and there'll be details going on the website later today as well. And Bracken Ash Church course is open with a different thing every week just to pop into and engage with the story. Super, thank you Adrian. Okay, well we're going to sing to start with but shall I just open with a prayer to commend our time to God. Father we thank you for this opportunity to gather. We are the church gathered as well as the church scattered. Thank you for this opportunity to gather to focus on your word to us, your love for us and to take it in as succor for our souls. So please bless us and may we bless you with our worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, Morris is going to read to us from Genesis, which is one of the set readings for today. Thanks, Morris. Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. 
Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And um, short reflection. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to sort my screen out. Um, short reflection. Please see this as, you know, sometimes when you buy a packet of nachos or soap powder or whatever, um, there's 10% extra free. Um, so it's not a second sermon. It's the, the, the kind of 10% extra free bit. Um, and it was because, I, I don't know whether you're like this, you know, I, I read a Bible passage again and again and again and again over the course of my life. And then you read it and you think, why did I never see that before? And what jumped out for me from this passage is how many times God talks about all life or every living thing. And, do you know, there are, there are no less than 10 occasions within that passage when God uses all life or every living thing. And if you could put the next slide on, Bev, um, you'll see what I mean, I think. So I've highlighted there every time when every living creature, the birds, the livestock, all the wild animals, every living creature, all life, every living creature, all living creatures, all life, all living creatures, all life. Um, quite remarkable that God's covenant to not destroy is with all of creation. It's not just humankind, it's all of creation. And it made me realize, I suppose, all over again, how precious all life is to God. Now, probably many of us have been watching David Attenborough's series, A Perfect Planet. Wonderful stuff. And the fifth and last one on humans had an economist and environmentalist by the name of Jeremy Rifkin um, speaking at various points. And in his opening piece, this is what he said. Thanks, Bev. We are likely to lose half the species on Earth over the next eight decades. The last time we had an extinction of this magnitude was 65 million years ago. And then he kind of looked hard into the camera and said, we are asleep. Half the species that God himself has covenanted not to destroy will be destroyed by humankind by the end of this century if we don't change our ways in regard to global warming. If we're not concerned, we should be. The interpretation board in Hethel Churchyard has a panel on it about biodiversity. Next time you visit, it's a beautiful afternoon today, have a read. If Rifkin is right, we should be alarmed as well as concerned. So that's my 10% extra that'll be reflected later in Alice's prayers. So thank you. And now we move on for Morris. Uh, sorry, we've got another, another hymn, another song. Great is thy faithfulness to remind us of God's promise to us. Thanks, Bill.
Morris is now going to read our second passage from Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. Proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Morris. So may we just pray for a moment before I start. Father God, by your spirit, please enable each of us to hear your word of love, support, encouragement or challenge today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And that's the territory that I'd like to explore today, knowing the love of Christ. Not knowing about, but knowing, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, because that's what we all want, isn't it? The Gospel of Mark is rarely anything other than brief, telescoped, condensed, in a hurry to get on. And today's reading is a prime example. In seven verses, he tells us about Jesus' baptism, the temptations, and the start of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Between them, the other gospelers need 25 verses. Mark does it in seven. But the benefit is that we get an overview of these events and their interconnectedness. If you'd been the father writing the script, I wonder if the order of events would have been the same. Might you, for example, have tested Jesus' readiness for service by giving him a hard time in the desert, and then given him some ministry to do, and then congratulated him on his success? Or might you have stretched him in the desert, then blessed him, and then sent him out. Instead, the father began by affirming Jesus. You are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life, as the message version of the Bible puts it. Then and only then does the father put him to the test. And only after this refining and strengthening does Jesus go out into service. Affirmation and acceptance. Time to take in the enormity of what's happened. Then Jesus starts his ministry. I believe that the same is true for us as daughters and sons of God. All of us need somehow to hear 
that we are God's beloved son or daughter and that he is well pleased with us. That I am loved and accepted, not because of what I've done for him, but because of what he's done for me. This is a definition of grace. And you know grace, you know that abbreviation, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. We love because he first loved us, as John, the so-called beloved disciple, wrote in his first letter. The clinical psychiatrist, Dr. Frank Lake, pioneered what is often called the cycle of grace. In short, Lake argued that people who knew they were accepted were able to achieve in a stable and consistent way. So perhaps you could put that slide up for us, Bev. So people who knew they were accepted were able to achieve in a stable and consistent way. On the other hand, striving to achieve in order to be accepted frequently led to burnout and a sense of failure. And he saw, Frank Lake saw the healthy pattern of life in Jesus, founding the idea of what he called clinical theology. If you look at these diagrams, first the cycle of grace, which starts with acceptance. Jesus knew he was loved by the Father, unconditionally, no matter what he did or didn't do. Jesus sought sustenance in that relationship with his heavenly Father through prayer, study, fellowship, and recreation. Jesus found significance. If you like, he knew who he was. He was comfortable and confident in his own skin. And from this secure base, Jesus was able to serve with no need to prove himself and no susceptibility to burnout. And now if you compare this with the cycle of works and ask yourself, how often you're in this mode. Because of our insecurities and less than perfect self-esteem, the danger is to run the thing backwards. Needing to achieve as a way of feeling significant and to find acceptance, or so we believe. But of course, it never works out that way. God doesn't need us to achieve as a route to acceptance by him. And our fellow humans are a fickle bunch with their own issues who often prefer to criticize rather than to praise. So seeking to achieve in order to gain acceptance is a never ending treadmill. We're all the product to some extent of imperfect parenting. So we're none of us experience, have experienced that total loving acceptance, which is, of course, where the grace of God begins. But we can seek to know that total love and acceptance from God, both in our head, by meditating on the, on the truths of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, and in our hearts by being open to the touch of his spirit as we spend time with him. That's the first point I want to make. Jesus was the man he was because he knew the love and affirmation of his father. How much more should we covet that for ourselves? Thanks, Bev. You can um, take that down now. Thank you. For me, really knowing God's love has happened most often when I've been in a tough place. For example, wrestling with something inside myself or in a relationship with another, or perhaps most significantly in a situation of profound loss or huge transition. Perhaps that was why the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Drove Jesus out, as Mark puts it. That's forceful. 
to experience extreme privation, to have a huge excess of time to do nothing but reflect and pray, to wrestle with the evil one and the thoughts planted in his head. The devil always wants to mess things up for Jesus and for us. So I wondered what we can learn from what Jesus went through as we make our own 40 day journey through Lent in locked down circumstances, very far from our own choosing. Here's a question. From what you can remember of Matthew or Luke's account, what was the first temptation that Jesus experienced? And perhaps you can, you can put the main screen bed back so that we can see everybody. So put your zoomy hand up if you think you know what was the first temptation that Jesus experienced. You can put it in the chat box or, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll invite you to share. Trevor's got his hand up. Go on, Trevor. I think it was the temptation to, for, for food to, to, turn, uh, to turn stones into bread. Okay, thank you for that. That's not the right answer. Okay. He and Tom said it was bread. Is that what Trevor's just said? Yes, yes. No, that's not the right answer. You may sense it's a catch question. Anybody else like to have a go? Becky. Yes, to doubt who he was. Exactly. If you are the son of God. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Jesus was invited to turn stones into bread. Absolutely right. In, in both Luke's and Matthew's account, the order of two and three are different in those two accounts. But in the first one is turning stones into bread. But really, the first temptation was if you are the son of God, is what Satan prefaced what he was saying with. Jesus been, had been driven out by the Spirit immediately from the Jordan to the wilderness with, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, ringing in his ears. And he had 40 days to savour this. And Satan has the neck to say to him, if you are the son of God. And I would suggest that that is the primal temptation to not believe what God has said. And of course, it was the same at the beginning of recorded time, the beginning of God-human relationship. God tells Adam and Eve what to do and what not to do. And along comes the serpent. And the first thing that the serpent says is, did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God say? And those words are part of our lives too, facing us with the choice. Do we follow what we believe God has said? Or do we doubt maybe hedge our bets, or sometimes even willfully disobey. And this, I believe, is what faith and trust are about on the positive side, and what sin is about on the negative side. Hopefully, <clears throat> not many of us here today dabble in willful disobedience to what we believe God is saying, either through his written word or his revealed guidance to us. But I dare say that many of us hedge our bets, relying on our own powers to get by, which is where the temptations that Jesus experienced might help us to see ways in which we can be lured away from the trust in God's love. Firstly, you're hungry, in great need of food. You know you can do it. Turn these stones into bread, is what the devil said to Jesus. For us, is this the temptation to use our own wits and capabilities 
to ensure that we have no great physical needs or to get us out of a tight spot. And so position or control or alcohol or even chocolate, anything that insulates us from the pressures of life, those things become our goal. Secondly, in Matthew's account, Jesus is taken to the pinnacle of the temple and challenged to throw himself down, trusting that Father God will send angels to catch him and save him from self-destruction. Is this the temptation to be Thomas, refusing to believe without evidence? This is a direct challenge to Jesus' faith. Perhaps for us, it's simply the temptation to doubt that God is on our case, especially when we don't feel that he is. And so we proceed as if he isn't. And you just wonder what Jesus would have been feeling, being driven out after that incredible experience at his baptism. And suddenly the spirit is driving him out into the wilderness. God, are you there? Matthew then tells us that the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Do you hear the echoes of Jesus stating that fundamental kingdom value? You can't serve God and wealth. It's not just that, as Timothy writes, the love of money is the root of all evil. In today's context, the context of our talk today, I believe Jesus is saying, don't let reliance on money and everything else that you have stand in the way of a relationship of total trust in God. In each of these situations, Jesus was being tempted to ignore, forget, or disbelieve. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. The literal word of God. His answer, of course, in these three examples was to quote scripture. The word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. Meet fire with fire. So when we are doubting or simply forgetting God's love for us, how can we use the word of God to rebut the temptation to trust in anything other than God? Can you use this locked down Lent as a time to spend more time reading the word of God, or a devotional book that will nurture your relationship with God? If you journal, even occasionally, why not remind yourself of God's specific words to you in the past? A bit like the Israelites returning to cairns erected to remind them of something amazing God did in that place. Can you spend more time just basking in God's love, in silence, or listening to whatever music, worship music helps you, from Teze to Townend, from Getty to New Wine, or from hymns and BBC songs of praise? Can you spend more time praying, perhaps even in a way that you haven't tried before? Not praying for things, but simply being in God's presence, sharing your heart with him, and listening in the silence for his voice. Adrian has mentioned resources that are being offered through the parish. The diocese is offering resources. And I'd recommend you look at the BBC Lent Retreat, which is using Ignatian prayer. And it's entitled Knowing Jesus with a different theme, a different image, a different passage, and some different music each day onlineprayer.net onlineprayer.net is what you need or if you just google 
the BBC Lent retreat. I looked this morning and the music for today literally brought tears to my eyes. Anything that helps you sense that affirmation, you are my beloved daughter, you are my beloved son, chosen and marked by my life, pride of my life. I don't normally say things like this. In my mind's eye last week, I saw Jesus as the Good Samaritan pouring the oil of love into the wounds of someone who'd been beaten up. I just wonder <clears throat> if that's anyone that's here today. And if something in you responds to that, then I'm sure that one of the prayer ministers would be happy to go into a breakout room with you or for a one-to-one -one walk with you and pray at some point. Finally, going back to today's passage from Mark, we learn that Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Luke's account is even more powerful. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And once in Nazareth, he stood up in the synagogue and read his manifesto from the scroll of Isaiah. We crave, I do anyway, such confidence, such faith, such powerful ministry, don't we? Where did it come from for Jesus? From the cycle of grace, starting with knowing the Father's love for him. Where will it come from for me? From the cycle of grace, starting with knowing the Father's love for me. The devil, or simply your own demons, quote unquote, will work to snatch that away. Don't let him succeed. Learn from Jesus in the wilderness how to cling on to what God has said, that he and you are his beloved child. I thought I'd, I finished, I thought I'd offer you a chance to do a bit of basking in the love of God by playing a piece of music that touches me. I hope it will touch and touch some of you too. You may like to follow the words on screen or you may like to close your eyes and listen. It's called Consider the Stars, sung by Kristin Getty. And I've deliberately put the confession and creed after this talk to help you respond. And if you remember nothing else from this morning, remember that. He who made all of this says, you're worth more than this and holds you in his hands. So let's say this confession together is a chance to turn back wholeheartedly to God in belief and trust. Jesus Christ, risen master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, Lord hear, hear us, us and, and help us. us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, Lord hear, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. 
Lord, hear us and help us. The Lord enrich us with his grace and nourish us with his blessing. The Lord defend us in trouble and keep us from all evil. The Lord accept our prayers and absolve us from our offences. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. So there's a little interlude, a thought, and then we'll move on and state what we believe together. And I've chosen to use the, the form of affirmation of faith, which you'll recognize from a baptism service, but it gives you a chance to say, I believe and trust in him. And you can say that loudly and strongly if you wish. So my question is, do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? I, I believe, believe and, and trust, trust in, in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I, I believe, believe and, and trust, trust in, in him. him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known to the world? I, I believe, believe and trust, trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This, this is, is our faith. faith. We, we believe, believe and trust in one God, God Father, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Spirit. We're going to sing again the familiar town end version of the Lord's my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd but I'll not want He makes me lie in pastures green He leads me by the still, still waters His goodness restores my soul and I will trust in you. 
is now going to lead our intercessions for us. Thanks, Alice. This morning, we have considered, among other things, the richness of God's creation and provision. And at the end of each section of prayers, I will say, open our eyes to see in your creation what you see and our response and give loving care so shall we say open our eyes to see in your creation what you see and, and give, give loving, loving care, care. let us begin this time of reflection and prayer with a well-known poem by W. H. Davies. What is this life if, full of care, we have no time to stand and stare? No time to stand beneath the boughs and stare as long as sheep or cows. No time to see when woods we pass, where squirrels hide their nuts in grass. No time to see in broad daylight, streams full of stars like skies at night. No time to turn at beauty's glance and watch her feet, how they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can enrich that smile her eyes began. A poor life this, if full of care, we have no time to stand and stare. Open our eyes to see in your creation what you see and Thank give you. loving, loving care. care. Father, we thank you for the beauty and richness of your world, especially this warmer weather, spring sunshine and flowers and fresh growth. We pray for those whose lives are busy and they are tired and feel they have little time to look at your generous provision. May they begin to see all you have given us and be richly blessed. Open our eyes to see in your creation what you see and, and give, give loving, loving care. care. We bring before you those whose lives and professions are closely linked to the earth and seas. Farmers, horticulturalists, gardeners, fishermen, miners, naturalists. This is often hard work. 
and may require challenging decisions. We pray for all national and world leaders whose decisions may impact on our environment. Open our eyes to see in your creation what you see and give loving care. Heavenly Father, when you made your creation, you saw that it was good. Forgive us for the many ways we selfishly damage your world. Bad farming practices, greedy fishing, pollution, poisoning of the earth and seas. As our world is afflicted by climate change, leading to extremes of temperature, drought and excessive rainfall. Lead us, Lord, to repent of our selfishness and reconsider and actively change our lifestyles for the improved well-being of all. Open our eyes to see in your creation what you see and, and give, give loving, loving care. care. Lord, we bring before you those whose lives are so full of cares and worries that they cannot see beyond them. Those struggling with the personal and practical impacts of the pandemic in their homes and at work, in unemployment, those working in the health service, those in government planning the future management of the situation. We pray for those who are lonely or abused, those with long physical and mental illness, those who are bereaved. Let us bring before God those personally known to us. And especially this week, we give thanks for the life of Edna Pollard and pray for David and his family at this sad time. Open our eyes to see in your creation what you see and give loving care. And finally, may we all join in this version of the Lord's Prayer from the New Zealand Prayer Book. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice 
be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us from trials too great to endure spare us from the grip of all that is evil free us for you reign in the glory of the power that is love now and forever amen Thank you so much, Alice, for that. And we're now going to sing our last song together, which is another Keith and Kristen Getty um, song, Magnificent, Marvellous, Matchless Love. Lord God, you hold both heaven and earth in a single piece. Let the design of your great love shine on the waste of our anger and sorrow and give peace to your church, peace among nations, peace in our homes and peace in our hearts. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen.